Hi everyone, my name is Matt Geary and I'm from the University of Chester. I know that originally Anna Muir was going to talk to you about um, our research in, onto the genetics of white face data. Um, unfortunately Anna couldn't uh, record a presentation for you, um, but what I'm going to try and do is talk to you a little bit about some of the research we've been doing here at the University of Chester over the past few years, um, including our current work on, on genetics and our plans for the future in that regard. So I'm a lecturer in conservation uh, biology. Um, most of my research and most of my conservation work is on birds, um, with a few other taxa thrown in. So I, I work on pangolins in Uganda, I work on um, some amphibian projects, um, and, and birds all over the place really, but including up in Scotland. So um, I've been working in the, in the highlands and the areas around the Black Isle in Scotland for a good number of years, um, particularly on red kites. On the Black Isle so I, I know a lot of locations in that area um, really quite well which will become relevant um, as we go on through the talk. I've also done work on uh, black grouse in Perthshire for my PhD and I'm currently working on projects involving Capercaillie in the Cairngorms and Golden Eagles uh, across the whole of Scotland um, and their interactions with different landscape um, features. So one of the things that, that I've sort of invo been involved in for a, a long time now is this sort of forest, moorland, bog habitat mosaic that ha that um, exists up in the north of Scotland. Um, I, I know a lot of those forests really well and, and their ecology is something that I've been involved in studying for a good long period. And um, somewhere along the line I also started to get involved in dragonflies, um, probably largely because of the local reintroduction project we've got close to the University of Chester in Delamere Forest. Um, and then local work became something that I, I linked up with some of the work that I was doing up in the north of Scotland. Um, so I've been working on white face data um, myself along with a number of different colleagues here and a number of different um, students, most of whose research I'll be talking to you about today, for the past five or six years. Um, and, and these are, you know, uh, species that, like I say, live at a lot of sites that I know really really well for other reasons so it's been quite nice to link up with some of those places again and get to know something completely different that I probably wasn't aware of the first time that I was there. So the reason that white face data are really interesting to me is that they're a specialist species so they have specialist uh, habitat requirements they, they are obviously specialists of lowland peat bogs um, and although they have a large European range, as do a number of the other species I've already mentioned, including black grouse and capercaillie and, and golden eagles, um, they are threatened or, or range restricted in the UK. So they're, they're red listed here in the UK and have this Scottish stronghold in a lot of those sort of forested and, and bog based habitats up in the north. Um, the recent state of the uh, UK's dragonflies report has suggested that they have a stable distribution. Um, their occupancy hasn't changed significantly during the period covered that, by that report across the whole of Great Britain, um, but has seen a slight decline in England. Um, one of the difficulties, I think, with species like white-faced data that I, I'm sure the report acknowledges is that it's hard to be sure of this because the monitoring effort is so um, patchy in terms of where species are seen or, or where individuals or which sites are monitored regularly. So I think, as with all specialist species, especially ones we think might be range-restricted, they warrant further research and, and they warrant specific monitoring a lot of the time. Um, so white-faced data is an interesting one from the point of view of a conservation biologist because um, there's all these questions about habitat and, and about their distribution even if it isn't currently changing that specialism makes them vulnerable to potential threats and also as we'll see later on in the talk um, potentially to things like isolation or, or uh, issues to do with connectivity so our research has um, encompassed so far four MRES projects, two looking more at habitat and, and individual populations and two looking more at the genetic side of things. Um, we've published papers on the habitat and distribution so far and we've also started to um, develop some methods, develop some techniques and, and develop some ideas related to using genetic methods to answer questions that we were unable to answer in, in sort of um, more um, field-based ways.
Our initial um, MRS project, um, partly funded by the British Dragonfly Society, was Rachel Davies. Um, Rachel worked mostly in Delamere Forest and at Fens and Wixel Moss. And Rachel did a huge amount of um, larval sampling, especially in Doolittle Moss, um, doing doing um, transects of the bog, essentially, which are not easy. And I'm sure, as you can imagine, not the most pleasant thing that, that you might want to do on, on some cold days. But luckily the sun was um, very kind to her um, and, and so was the bog. I think there was only one or two incidents of falling in. Um, and she was surveying on that site as well as using uh, larval sampling and surveying for adults there and at Fens and Wixel Moss in 2017. Um, and Rachel was particularly interested in looking at habitat associations um, based on larvae but also adults and, and looking at emergence as well and which habitats individuals were emerging from. And the idea originally was that she would monitor the reintroduction. So she would take part in that reintroduction monitoring and try to get an idea for how that monitoring was was going um, in Delamere and potentially how the reintroduction was going as well. So Rachel used transect surveys um, around the edges of the pond for adults and exuvia, so she walked um, specific routes around Doolittle Moss and did similar surveys on Fens and Wixel Moss, um, counting adults and counting exuvia. She also did larval sampling, um, uh, which was her wading through the bog there, to try and get an idea of which habitats within the moss itself were being used um, by, the, um, by the larvae. Um, we also had an attempt at mark release recapture um, the idea was that we would try and, and develop a good method for this so that in the future we could use it um, in the Delamere reintroduction. Unfortunately, the Delamere reintroduction was, was not um, big enough at that time and probably still isn't um, to allow this kind of method to, to take place. But the idea was that if we've got a good idea of how this works and what kind of recapture rates we would get, um, then we could we could actually employ that in the future and in the meantime we could use that to have a little look about where adults were, were actually spending their time on Fens and Wixel Moss so get some habitat investigation in while we perfected the method. In terms of Delamere um, it wasn't the most successful survey period. Um, we found two white-faced data larvae in Doolittle Moss itself. Um, those of you who know the site might be aware it's quite a, a big area really for a, for a pond, um, certainly bigger than the sites we sampled on Fens and Wixel Moss. Um, but obviously this suggests there's not a huge amount of larvae present in, the, in that site at, um, during that period. In addition to that we only saw two adults on the surveys and I believe only five adults were seen during the flight period in that year. Um, so this is suggesting that the population present at Doolittle wasn't um, increasing in the way that perhaps people might have hoped um, but also that you know that there were white face data at the site which is is quite um, useful this I think initially was something of concern but um, one of the things that, that gave me a little bit of hope in terms of this and hope in terms of that Delamere introduction was this paper about um, a reintroduction in, in uh, Eastern Europe, so a Slovakian reintroduction um, where individuals were moved because of some um, industrial uh, development. And this paper looked at the um, level seen at 15 years after the reintroduction. And 15 years after this reintroduction, um, only 6 to 10 adults were seen on the site, even though over 100 exuvia were counted. Now this is very different to the types of numbers that, that we're getting from um, some of the more successful reintroductions in England, um, but does seem quite similar to, to the numbers that are being seen in Delamere. So I do have a little bit of hope that although um, the numbers of adults seen might not be increasing in, in the way that people might, might like, it may not be um, a complete loss for this site. And it's something that um, you know, I'm hoping will, will change over the years. And I'll still spend time in Delamere and, and you know, hope that at some point in the future we might get back to having a look at this population and, and hopefully see something similar to this, that it could be the habitat complexity around it and, and just the nature of the site that means it's hard to monitor um, and that even as we see in, in populations increase which hopefully they will even though slowly um, we might end up in, in a similar situation to this where we have a, a you know ongoing population over 15 years of, of population um, sort of persistence here but not seen as much sort of in the air as we might hope uh, even though things aren't going as badly as they seem. On the other side of things, we were able to find some information out. We found 14 exuvia 
so we had 14 uh, individuals emerge in that year. Um, we found that emergent sites were not related to sphagnum cover or emergent vegetation, uh, and there was no relationship between emergence and temperature. So even though we were finding um, negative results here, these were two of the questions that we really wanted to ask. Were they more likely to emerge on, on days that were warmer or days where the water temperature was warmer? So we had data loggers underwater for the entire period, um, and we found that there wasn't a relationship between either air temperature or water temperature at the time. And although we found more individuals emerging on the soft rush than the cotton grass, we found that there was no um, difference in, in the type of emergent vegetation overall, um, in, in that we couldn't find a significant difference between these two species um, based on the exuvia we found. Obviously it being quite a small number, um, th this wasn't a particularly precise comparison. But we also found that the exuvia weren't found uh, in areas with greater sphagnum cover, which was the kind of thing we, we thought might happen on the moss, especially compared to some of the other sites we knew elsewhere. At Fens and Mixel worked on moss, um, we were relatively successful with our mark recapture study. Uh, we did 13 sampling days um, and we caught quite a lot of white face data in that time. But Unfortunately, our recapture rate was very low. We only caught recaught 5% of the individuals that um, we originally marked. So we were able to estimate survival over that period as around 6%. But having said that, we think with a lot more um, intensive capturing and intensive surveying, um, we might be able to actually get slightly different values to that. However, um, the kind of thing that, that that brings into question is how much effort is it worth to do this recapturing? Um, and, and hopefully sort of um, what I can suggest later on in this talk is some methods that can give us similar information over perhaps slightly different time scales without the need for that much effort, which is hard enough to do on Fens and Wixel Moss, quite an open area where, where the dragonflies aren't too hard to recapture, um, but would be really quite difficult in some sites with more complex vegetation, um, which would need even more effort and probably even more survey hours and, and surveyors to actually make it worthwhile. One of the things we were able to do with this data though is to have a look at some um, habitat associations. So using information from three transects where we recorded presence of, of um, individual adults and inferred absences from the squares where we had no records over that time, we were able to use a selection index to look at which habitats were preferred. And what we found on Sven's, uh, Fens and Wixel Moss was that um, the dragonflies preferred the open moss. Um, overwhelmingly. They really avoided the areas with scrub and scrub and moss and certainly with woodland. Um, now we did think that there may be an effect of, of detectability here. It's something that is often an issue in ecological studies and something that would be very very useful to take account of um, in terms of, of dragonfly monitoring and dragonfly um, sort of conservation. Um, unfortunately, we didn't really have the data to investigate this from this study. Um, having said that, the, the breeding pools at the site are all over the open moss area uh, and, the, and the areas with scrub tend to be drier, they tend to be dried out. So it might be that on these sites this habitat selection is actually occurring and the open moss is closer to areas which are obviously providing that resource for the species. It's maybe not something we'd expect in, in the more heavily forested sites that we see elsewhere in the white-faced data's range. So it's definitely something that we were interested in investigating up in the Scottish part of their, um, their UK range, because there they tend to be much closer to the trees, uh, and, and particularly females seem to blend in really incredibly well with the um, understory vegetation of these old pine forests. So we wonder if that is something that might be slightly different depending on the, on the vegetation present at the site. Rachel was really successful in her work. Um, we were really, really proud of what she did. She managed to get this paper published in the Journal of the British Dragonfly Society um, and has also gone on to fantastic things working on river projects and now working for the Field Studies Council and really kicking off all of our white face data research. What we were also doing at this time, myself and a, another member of staff, were having a look at the broader distribution of white face data. So we decided to use a species distribution model to investigate the habitats that were most associated with white face data sightings. We used dragonfly records from the BDS. Um, in fact, we got a lot of help from BDS Scotland in this. Um, 
So we got whiteface data records and used a method called maxent or maximum entropy modeling to try and um, investigate the, the relationships between the presence records and the habitat features around them. We used variables like pine cover, um, cover of um, moorland, standing water and bog woodland, um, conifer cover in general, so that's, um, that's conifers that aren't specifically pine, and then some um, variables that relate to climate and temperature and also one um, which reflects potential evapotranspiration, so, so how wet the vegetation and the habitat is. And what we found was that in the Scottish part of their range, which was the area of particular interest to us, were that white-faced data distributions were most heavily um, associated with pine forest. In fact, the, the most um, important variables were pine forest, um, this potential evapotranspiration, and annual temperature. And those three things together were able to highlight a, a good range of places where we knew white-faced data were found. Um, so we found a number of sites that were well recorded within these data sets. We were also able to look at some of the more recent um, British Dragonfly Society magazines to look at recent sightings and, and found that some of the new sites that were been discovered were actually predicted by our models using a presence data set earlier than this. So this suggests that our models work on some level. We also knew that they tended to over predict in some areas. I'm sure some of you who are familiar will be able to see areas on this map where white face data aren't found. But what these models do is suggest areas where the habitat is, is probably right for them. So there'll be some areas that they can't get to or they wouldn't be in, in for other reasons that aren't included in the model, but that do have those same features as the sites where they're found. Um, the difficult thing was there were also a few sites where we knew whiteface data were found that weren't predicted by our model, particularly the site on the Black Isle at, at Mona Moor. Um, we think the reason for this is that it was, it was fairly difficult to get a good fine scale um, layer of, of pine forest habitat. So we know that pine forest exists on Mona Moor, but on a lot of the habitat maps we were using, it comes up as a, a mixed plantation forest or a, a less natural forest. And we think that's why it wasn't selected in, in some of these models. And that's why you can't see a bright spot on the map to represent that site. But overall, the models were able to, to tell us about how um, whiteface data distribution is associated with these forests and we were again able to publish that in uh, insect conservation and diversity um, actually just earlier this year when we finally completed that work. Alongside that work we tried to get a bit more information about how um, these sites are sort of special in terms of their habitat. So we got Cassie Jones, another MRES student in 2018, to go up and look at two particular sites at Mona Moor on the Black Isle and Abernethy Forest in the Cairngorms. And Cassie did larval sampling, exuvial sampling and lots of adult transects as well as measuring lots of things about the vegetation around them to try and, and come up with these key ideas about what makes a good white face data site compared to other ponds in the area. She found larvae in three of 13 pools, um, which was kind of disappointing. It was a particularly dry year, we think, that year, which meant some of the pools that might have previously been suitable weren't. Um, but we also knew from her analyses that, that we actually got quite good detection. So we, we think we got uh, larvae detected in 83% of the times that it was actually there, which is, is relatively high. So we think this actually did reflect the, the individual pools where whiteface data were found. Although we did find Exuvia at four of, of 14 sites by adding an extra one, suggesting that we could have probably sampled that one for larvae as well. And then we found adults at seven sites. So this didn't necessarily mean that adults were, were um, sort of had bred in those pools or had emerged from those pools, but were happy prospecting areas um, to breed in the future. The results from these analyses suggested that Exuvia counts were associated with emergent vegetation. But again, just like our work in Delamere Forest, not with the amount of sphagnum in the forests. So more emergent vegetation means we found more exuvia, um, which makes a, a certain amount of sense, um, but not necessarily in areas with, with more sphagnum. However, adults were found in areas with more sphagnum, potentially suggesting that they're using that sphagnum layer as a visual cue um, to try and find um, sites to breed in, or potentially they were associated with sites where they did, breed, uh, where they did emerge themselves.
Higher adult counts were also associated with taller trees, although not percentage of pine forest, probably in this case because nearly all of our sites were within some kind of pine forest, um, suggesting that they might be suitable in the first place. But the taller trees relationship suggests that they were in areas of mature forest, and again this might relate to the use of that understory layer um, for something like camouflage or, or protection um, and, and a level of security, particularly maybe for females as they're, as they're um, sort of using areas to, to hide out before they breed. What we'd found out so far then, low recapture rates, um, sites not occupied in all years because not all of the sites where we knew white face data were found had larvae in when Cassie checked. Um, and an idea that dispersal is potentially variable. We found a lot of white face data close to the pools where we originally marked them in our mark recapture study and we also knew that, that individuals were getting to new sites where we hadn't found larvae. Because we knew recapture rates were low, we didn't think it was worthwhile using mark recapture in the wider sort of highland population um, because of the effort involved. But what we thought was that we could use genetic methods to do similar things. So what genetic methods offer us is a way of, of looking at long-term connectivity between sites. If two different sites have individuals that share genetic material, then it implies movement over a long time scale. And that's really what we were interested in. So how do whiteface data get to different sites, um, which sites are connected, and how potentially does that relate to the habitats around them? So we got two more MRES students to study this. Um, unfortunately, both of these students were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So they had plans for field work, they had plans for specific research questions, which were then um, quickly shelved when we realised we weren't able to start the field season we had planned in early 2020. But what they did was some really, really useful groundwork for us. So Matthew Williams started off um, by comparing the level of, of, or the amount of genetic data he was able to extract from Exuvia and also from some um, white face data legs that we had, um, that we'd sampled uh, in an earlier field season. So we were trying to find out whether we could get good enough samples from non-invasive sampling um, related or compared to the information we can get from invasive sampling. What he then also tried to do was, was make some inference about um, dispersal in whiteface data by comparing them to similar species. So using their genetic relatedness to make some predictions about what their dispersal might be using information from species that we know a bit better. And what was really interesting is that Matthew was actually able to get more um, or higher concentrations of DNA out of the exuvia, um, even though both exuvia and the legs provided good DNA. This was quite an unusual result. Um, this this wouldn't really be expected. The exuvia and the DNA and the legs were collected at the same time. Uh, the legs were frozen, whereas the exuvia were kept dry, I believe. So we expected this result to be the other way around. Um, it's something that we do want to investigate further because Although we'd quite like it if we could get more information out of Exuvia, we were wondering here whether this was something to do with the way that the legs were stored and whether we might be able to, to store this more effectively. Because what we weren't able to do was then go on to, to sequence that DNA and compare the quality of the sequences we get out. So that's something that we really hope to do um, in the near future. The comparative methods to try and predict dispersal distance didn't work particularly well. Um, this works really well in other species and other taxa um, and we've used it really effectively for birds and, and mammals and other things within the department in the past but I think just the information isn't strong enough in terms of, of what we know about other dragonflies to make this useful so we really need species specific information and we really really need to, to focus on white face data for that. Our other MRS student in 2019, Lottie Middleton, took a different approach. She used our original habitat suitability model um, to try and understand the barriers to movement and dispersal for whiteface data. So originally she was going to combine this with genetic methods and try and get an idea of where individuals had actually moved in the past. But because she couldn't do the fieldwork in, in this area and couldn't collect the samples she needed and do the lab work she, she was after, um, then she focused on the habitat and created what we call resistance surfaces, which use the habitat to make suggestions about where individuals might be able to travel based on good habitat. So this was based on our habitat suitability model using a piece of software called CircuitScape. 
And what Lottie found was really interesting and probably becomes the basis for a lot of what we'll do next in terms of research. She found high connectivity within some of the species strongholds that we'd, we'd looked at. So areas around Loch Marie, uh, Glen Affric and parts of the Black Isle and particularly the Cairngorms. We also found a series of more isolated populations, particularly down in the south, um, suggesting that these, these areas will either have some sort of other connectivity or may not be very well connected, which would be a worry. And what Lottie was able to suggest was some management units that we might use to think more closely about conservation for, of white-faced data in the future. So what threats might they face and why might we be thinking about this conservation? Well, in a working landscape like the Scottish Highlands, there's always the threat of habitat change. Um, these, these areas have seen large amounts of habitat change over the past few hundred years as sporting interests have changed, as industrial interests have changed, the forestry sector certainly had um, ups and downs and has changed the types of species that are grown and now we're seeing the importance of recreation become much more to the fore. So we do see changes in the way forests are used and we're also seeing climatic changes. So for a species that relies on bog habitats, which are vulnerable to things like drying out, but also changes in the hydrology around them due to climate change, this is a worry. And then we've also got this added worry of isolation of individual sites, that if habitat changes in the wider landscape, that we cut off individual pockets. And if they then wink out because it's dry that year or they don't have particularly good breeding seasons, they might not be able to get any reinforcing dispersal to, to maintain their populations over time. So this is where we come back to our management units. Lottie identified three areas which seem to have good connectivity that we could start to think about these ideas from. So she looked at Loch Marie, uh, the Glen African Black Isle sort of um, complex and in Abernethy and the Cairngorm um, sort of um, forest area. So the, the, the stretch of, of the kind of Cairngorm forest um, around Rothy Mercus and in Shriuk down to Glen Feshi and up to Abernethy and just above that in the north. And what we want to look at here is connectivity within those units and potentially how connectivity might have happened between them. So one of the things that we'd like to be able to recommend is, is the most effective way of long monitoring these populations in the long term and managing those landscapes in a joined up way that means we can maintain this connectivity and maintain these populations of white-faced data. We've already had a, a really useful field season collecting more samples to allow us to do this genetically. We've had loads of help from people in the BDS, um, particularly uh, Daniel Muir and Pat Batty and a number of other volunteers like Colin Hall and um, Jonathan Willett. And we really appreciate all of their help and the help of anyone else who has um, submitted records or gone out and done sampling at different times for us. And we've also sort of developed a new team to work on this project um, as we go forward. So Nayara Sales is a, a member of staff who's just joined at Chester, who's a geneticist. Um, we've also linked up with Robert Hiella at Salford. And David O'Brien and Jeanette Hall at SNH have kind of really driven this forward over the last few months. And obviously they're based in the area with a lot of local information and local contacts. The idea um, from here is that we finish our current work. We, we use the samples that we've already been collected, some of which Anna had already started to do lab work on, and link this up with our habitat maps to get those genetically informed resistant surfaces. So to develop some landscape genetic information for the species. What we need to do is extract current samples. We hopefully have an MSc student doing that this year, and then inform these resistant maps by looking at where um, populations are genetically related then we can use the habitat uh, suitability from these maps to infer routes of dispersal. And this will allow us to investigate areas of con connectivity, maybe really important patches of habitat that are the link between two different populations, um, and also how that connectivity might have changed over time. What we'd then like to do is take that even further forward. So Nayara is particularly an expert on eDNA uh, and, and finding DNA in uh, aquatic samples. So we're um, interested in using this to inform occupancy over time. So areas that have contained white-faced data in the recent past or where white-faced data might be found in small numbers. And we'd also like to use Robert Yeller's uh, expertise to look at population genetics within our population. So within and between sites in areas like the Black Isle or in the Cairngorms can show us not only how those populations are, are linked, but how um, effective that connection is between different sites and what might happen in terms of their genetics in the future. 
So we'll try and use genetic information, local habitat information and population monitoring to link these ideas together and really get an idea of, of the, the um, sustainability of these populations over time. And then we would like to take that further to develop dragonfly conservation ecology the way it is for other taxa. So explore drivers of species distributions, start to look more closely at demographics and population change and develop some ideas of evidence-based management for the species. Our next steps are to, to try and push this to potentially look at other northern specialists, um, look at white-faced data movements and population structure in more detail. We've got some ideas of expanding this out to Europe. We have some expertise out in the Alps, um, which also have a white-faced data population, and we may be able to, to sort of think about some field work there in the very long term. And then we'll start to think about other species and locations as well once we've developed these ideas more fully for white-faced data. So this is something that I think as, as a group, as a department, we've had a lot of um, interest in in the past and we hope that will continue in the future. Uh, we really appreciate the support we've received from the BDS, both as an organisation and from, from volunteers and people with, with a real interest and passion for dragonflies. Um, and we hope we can continue to do that. Um, so we hope to be able to give you lots more information in the near future and, and someone may well come and talk to you again and hopefully tell you all the things about the genetic connectivity that I wasn't able to um, because of our slight delay in the projects due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks very much for listening folks, I really appreciate it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.